An estimated 583 billion plastic bottles were produced in 2021. That is 100 billion more than were produced just five years ago. This year, 5 trillion plastic bags will be used. That's 160,000 every second. Each year, enough bubble wrap is created globally to cover the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Americans alone use a half a billion drinking straws every day. It's crazy. How are people using two straws a day? Oh my god. It's pretty staggering, especially because, you know, we're talking more and more about the environmental movement and how we need to be moving away from these systems, yet nothing's really being done. I feel disappointed with us, like as a society, like this isn't just on one person or one like section of the world, it's all of us. Plastic kind of has overtaken our lives in the last 100 years or so. We didn't use it before we found it, um, but now it's integral into everything we do. You can't go a day without using plastic. And there's a lot of issues with that that we're just coming to realize, whether that be health implications for yourself, health implications for those around you, and then, of course, health implications for the environment. It's scary to think about like all of the plastic pollution that exists and how it's like it seems difficult because it's such a big problem to like fix it, but it's definitely something we need to work on. I would start um, using reusable water bottles more often than I usually do and um, carry around a reusable bag too and not use straws like anymore. Try not to use like takeout containers either. Another way to show gratitude is just to kind of figure out how much plastic you're using in your day to day and then using our plastic calculator on the earthday.org website, you can kind of calculate how much you're using and then your reduction, how much that leads to in a year. For Earth Month this year, the pledge I'm going to take is to, if I order a, a cup of coffee from a restaurant or a coffee shop, to bring my own cup and to not take a plastic. Sorry. Hey everyone, happy Earth Week. My name is Aiden Sharon. I'm the End of Plastics and Canopy Project Coordinator at EarthDay.org. Uh, today we are joined by members of the environmental community to discuss the dangers of plastics, the roles corporations play in the production of plastic and the waste produced, as well as the greenwashing techniques used by these corporations to cover up the damage they have done to the communities and our planet. Uh, first, I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Holly Thompson, Holly is a zero waste associate for the US Public Interest Research Group. She works on the Beyond Plastic campaign to educate the public and build support for eliminating single use plastic. She has done work on the PERDS Whole Foods campaign as well as lobbying Congress to pass the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, a national bottle bill, produce responsibility and other legislation. In her free time, she likes to hike, cook and upcycle clothes. Next we have Dom Ferris. Uh, in 2019, after 10 years leading Surfers Against Sewage, Beach Clean Education, and Regional Reps programs, Dom took a leap of faith, striking out alone to see if Trash Free Trails could become an organization to be proud of. Today, as CEO of Trash Free Trails, one of Dom's core working principles is that TFT will not get stuck upon the hamster wheel of litter picking, whereby each year hundreds of thousands of people are called together to remove the same amounts and types of single-use product pollution. Then standing alongside the very same brands that we find each time, we smile and imply that we've kept things tidy. It is in Dom's belief, at best, this is becoming demotivating to the people who donate their time to protect what they love. However, he fears something more sinister is at play, that our biggest, big, biggest, best, bestest litter pits have become mass greenwashing events for the very same brands whose products choke our ecosystems from summit to sea. With the added bonus of implying that it's okay to keep consuming and discarding single-use products because like some kind of beach cleaning, Bill Murray and Groundhog Day, we the peoples whose playgrounds and wild places are swamped by their trash. We'll play nice and pick it up for them every year. In the simplest possible terms, TFT does not clear up for big oil. They remove single-use pollution from our trails and wild places for ourselves. If commercial partners want to support this work, they must be prepared to own their share of the problem and be prepared to put in the time and toil it takes to create sustained positive change. In short, we got to trust each other. Next up, we have Reverend Yearwood, President and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus, 
a minister, community activist, U.S. Air Force veteran, and one of the most influential people in hip-hop political life. After Hurricane Katrina in 2005, he established the award-winning Gulf Coast Renewal Campaign, where he led a coalition of national and grassroots organizations to advocate for the rights of Katrina survivors. As a national leader and pacemaker with the Green Movement, he works to bridge the gap between communities of color and environmental advocacy. He is a leader in campaigns calling for divestment from fossil fuels, causing climate change, increasing diversity in the climate movement, ensuring everyone has clean water and air, and international efforts to address climate change. Our final panelist who will be joining us in a pre-recorded interview is Rebecca Brown. Rebecca serves as the USA Director for Tobacco-Free Portfolios and is committed to encouraging major U.S. financial institutions to join the 190-plus global signatories of the Tobacco-Free Finance Pledge, representing $16 trillion U.S. dollars. Previously, Rebecca worked for Kramer Rosenthal McLenn, LLC, a boutique asset manager as director of marketing and client service for over 16 years. There, she was responsible for both institutional and high net worth client service, marketing, and business development. Importantly, she led the firm's first responsible investing efforts, including drafting and oversight of its policies and procedures. She also successfully advocated for CRM to become a signatory of the Principles for Responsible Investment in 2017 and the firm's formal exclusion of tobacco from its investment portfolios in 2019. During her career, she also held positions working for high net worth individuals at Merrill Lynch, Sanford Bernstein, and Financial Planning Corporation in Mitteline. Rebecca pivots from the private sector was based on her passion to contribute as a director, directly as possible to responsible and sustainable finance. All right. I want to start off today's panel with a question to Holly. Holly, what role do you foresee companies playing in the fight against plastic pollution? Yeah, so for me, the public sector um, is really good at implementing bans and trying to get rid of single-use plastic that way. But to me, the role of the companies is to implement those reusable systems, right? If we ban everything, but we don't have those systems in place in order to refill and reuse our containers, then um, there needs to be an extra component there. So the company's role is because they have the capacity to implement systems such as refillable and reusable containers that they have to step up and do that role. Um, and this comes from both the upstream and the downstream. So I'm gonna kind of go over some examples for that. Um, some of the work I've done um, involves Whole Foods, like Aiden said, and basically what they can do is they can um, not only reduce plastic in their own 365 brand with reducing the amount of plastic windows that are on pasta boxes um, and not wrapping all this these fruits and vegetables in pla extra plastic that they don't need. But they can also put pressure on some of um, the brands that sell in their stores to reduce their plastic. So not only can they reduce plastic in their own storefront uh, products, but they can also um, take it a little more upstream and put pressure on their suppliers and the supply chain that they have. Uh, and like I said, um, Whole Foods it tries to have the sustainable reputation in plastic uh, reduction is a big part of that. So that's a uh, way it can be downstream and more consumer facing. And then with companies like Nike and Smartwool, um, they're less consumer facing with stores and things like that. Um, but they have programs where you can take back your old sneakers and your old socks. Uh, I'm a hiker. I really like that Smartwool has a program where you can bring back old socks when you're buying new ones in order for them to recycle the fabric. Um, and the reason why I am bringing up fashion and kind of textiles is because almost two thirds of the clothes and different textiles we get are made of plastic. Um, a lot of people don't know fabric and fashion that's also comes from oil. Uh, so that's a really important um, downstream uh, part that can in company that can get involved um, but yeah these are 
the reason why companies are so important is they actually have the means to face these hurdles that happen in the supply chain that we don't think about when we're just banning plastics. They have to put in the effort to, you know, take extra steps to have refillable and returnable and eventually circular solutions. So um, they take the responsibility to take back these items and refill them instead of just, uh, you know, greenwashing, which we'll talk about a little later. Thank you, Holly. Dom, what are some ways cleanups can be used for advocacy to go beyond picking up the trash that you see on the ground? Make sure I unmute. Um, yeah, uh, so so this is this is an interesting one, and for anyone who's been, you know, leading litter picks, beach cleans, trail cleans, whatever you call them, trash cleanups, um, is something that the longer you lead them for, the more you start thinking about. Um, like I said, like you read in the bio there, this feeling of being stuck on a kind of hamster wheel of litter picking. So if you, in, in my opinion, in trash free trails, in our opinion, if you um, think about the litter pick trail clean as purely about the act of removing that single use pollution or litter from the environment um, and nothing more for us that feels like a missed opportunity um, so what we what we actually use our um, our kind of community we call them community trail cleans for community beach cleans for as a community gathering so for us it's about coming together to um, in the places that we love and we use for our recreation or for our health and well-being um, it's, it's about coming together and through the simple yet meaningful act of removing single use pollution from these places, we demonstrate what they mean to us. We send really clear messages about um, the, the fact that we as individuals and as communities are willing to donate our time, our talent, our passion to keep them clean. But it also provides this really um, stable grassroots foundation for to launch more, you know, um, well, not more, but uh, more impactful industry and government campaigns. You know, and again, my work, work with Surface Against Sewage, um, you know, I was really proud to be part of that team that pulled together these thousands of people around the UK and around the world to demonstrate that. And then our campaigns team took that along with some really great um, ideas for, in, you know, improved and increased legislation to government. Uh, and we can see the set, you know, we were involved with, uh, really heavily involved with the 5p, the five pence uh, carrier bag charge implementation, which has reduced, you know, the number of carrier bags by billions that we're seeing in our environment. So, uh, yeah, starting simple, doing it for the right reasons, for a positive reason, because because of love, not hate, not because you're angry or outraged about litter, and then using that as that building block, as that gra grassroots foundation um, for, you know, industry and legislative change. Well, to build off of that, how much responsibility do you think corporations should be taking for the waste that you're seeing and the waste that is littered all over the world? I mean, I attend cleanups pretty frequently. I did one on Friday. But how much do you think, how much responsibility do you think corporations should take? Well, it's like, it's, it's one of the, one of the biggest, like, hot potatoes and one of the most um, controversial um, uh, conversations you can have with your grassroots community, talking about responsibility. Um, you know, you could, you, you know, any one of us could do a tweet now about how we found uh, a Coca-Cola bottle, for example, on our beach, or uh, and we could say that it's Coca-Cola's fault that it's there, or we could even just imply that. Uh, and you would probably, all of us, would probably get, um, not trolled so much, but get some fairly outraged responses from members of the community saying, it's not Coca-Cola's fault that some scumbags dropped it. It's litterer's fault. It's got nothing to do with Coca-Cola. And um, so that that narrative is the more you look into it. And as we spoke about earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a master's research project in this. That narrative hasn't happened by accident. So the first thing we need to do is unpick, in my opinion, unpick the story uh, of why of, of the story of the litter bug, for example. Um, now, these things haven't come about by accident. The, the litter bug as a character um, that we all think about and, and, and despise um, was created by uh, an alliance of um, big business in 1954 in response to um, a Vermont law banning single-use drinks containers because they were being thrown by youngsters glass bottles into haystacks and one influential farmer in Vermont one of his cows or some of his cows uh, were killed 
from eating the hay with the glass in. They rallied Coca-Cola, uh, Dixie Cups, American Can Company rallied because they realized that this is a massive threat to the um, to what they saw as their uh, big cash cow uh, convenience, single use items. So they rallied, they workshopped and they came up with a litter bug. And what that essentially did very deliberately was turn the entire entire focus of responsibility for single use product pollution in our environment, because that's what it is, call it litter, but actually it's pollution in our environment onto the consumer. So right now, as of, from then till now, 100% of the responsibility has been put onto the consumer. That's not, that's not right. Now we can't, we're not going to swing all the other way, say 100% of the responsibility is, is on Coca-Cola. But again, this polarization that we see in all areas of, of life, you know, political life, so, you know, social life, that it has to be, has to be black or white. It has to be um, one person's fault or the others. No, it's a shared responsibility. The big business have to have responsibility for the, for the, for the life cycle of their product, especially if those businesses are using our wild places to sell their product, um, which so many of them do, but also the consumer isn't free of responsibility, you know, because they have choice. Uh, but the cool thing is if you connect all of those dots up, you can actually improve the relationship between the consumer and the, um, and the business. And also um, you can improve their, their responsibility and sense of contribution towards the places that they purport to love. So yeah, very, very important is, I, I don't want to quantify it. I just want to say it's shared. Own your share of responsibility. Thank you for that, Dom. Reverend Yearwood, I want to pose this next question to you. Uh, do you feel like the petrochemical industry has been targeting marginalized communities kind of the same way that we've seen the tobacco industry? The, the, the direct answer is yes. Without a doubt, they have been targeting and putting their facilities in vulnerable communities, literally to the point that those communities are called sacrifice zones. And so the petrochemical industry, for those who don't know, creates fertilizer, it creates plastic, it creates vinyl chloride, it creates a number of things from fossil fuels, um, straws and other types of plastics that end up downstream, but upstream where these plants are, they're usually putting these plants in vulnerable communities. And in these communities, they're doing just horrendous things in a way in which they're causing communities to have asthma and emphysema and cancer. And so, yes, the, the, it's that, that's, a, that's without a doubt. Their, their business plan is a death sentence like it was for tobacco for many communities, but not just for communities of color, to be very, very clear. It's all communities. I mean, I don't want, and that's one of the biggest things here. There's just kind of this sense that it's happening in other communities. We just saw recently, for instance, that the uh, shipment, uh, on the Norfolk Southern Trail Railways uh, that were derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, was vinyl chloride, which is a petrochemical. And then they had it was such, such a deadly compound, they had to explode it before it blew up the entire town. And that is a predominantly white town. So really anybody could be on the front line or the fence line of petrochemicals or vinyl chloride or anything like that. So without a doubt, it is directly connected and something that we have to stop. Uh, you know, right now there is the idea as we need to shift from fossil fuels to clean energy. There's the outrageous idea that the expansion of petrochemical, they want to build 120 more new facilities across the country, primarily in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Texas, and Louisiana. So it's outrageous that while we should be transitioning uh, and getting rid of petrochemicals and in essence, curbing our reliance on plastics. They want to build more facilities because this is the key thing, because the fossil fuel industry knows that this is their last lifeline. And so they realize that plastics is oil and that is their last lifeline. We are beginning to transition in many ways from the traditional ways of using oil. So they realize now that using petrochemicals to create plastics is their way to stay in business. Well, with that, what can each of us do as community members do to prevent further damage to these communities and to the, our communities that we're all living in? What, what are some steps that each of us could take? 
Well, I think that the, 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 for me, the first thing is that the climate movement is at a critical juncture. I think that we have to be very serious about the moment that we're in, that we're in a climate crisis. This is not a game. And I think that we have to be in a situation looking at our leadership. Uh, climate, we need real climate leadership on the policy front. Um, and climate, climate leadership doesn't mean, frankly, that you are talking about renewables and stopping plastic straws on Monday, but then you're trying to build plants uh, and facilities in the Arctic or in the Gulf, in the Gulf South. So that that that's one thing. We need to have real, real uh, climate leadership on all levels. The second thing I think that we can do is that we need to really stop the mentality of not holding companies ac ac accountable. I appreciate Dom's answer because I think that there is a situation where, like the like the tobacco industry, the the companies today are specifically using. Um, are, are particularly, I, I would say, almost like a pathological integrity of people to try to keep them from not realizing that they're the ones who are actually committing the harm. And so they say, well, look, you, you're, you're driving a car and look, you took a plane ride or, or look, you did this. In the meantime, well, we know that their, their creation of the plastics is the main reason why we cannot curb. And they have choices. That's the thing about it. They, we're not telling them to go out of business. We're seeing them to stop creating things that, that harm our planet and our, and, and our world. The third thing I think is that as a, as a movement, I think that we ourselves need to look at our, look at where we are. You know, I, I appreciate Earth Day uh, Network and Earth Day. I love my dear sister Kathleen Rogers and the whole team there. Um, and I appreciate them really trying to do climate education. I think that we have to get really serious about that, what it means to educate our communities and those around the country and the world about where we are in this moment. And last but not least, I got to say, this is very important from a philanthropy standpoint. Um, I do think that we have to look at how we're resourcing and funding uh, our efforts to stop petrochemicals, our efforts to stop plastics, our efforts to really build up the, 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 the grassroots movement so that not only can we have uh, legislation, not only can we have litigation, which is very important, but we must have demonstration. We still need to have people who are not only in the suites, but in the streets. And so I think that is very important at this moment that we continue to encourage that and tell people to make sure they do all they can do. Thank you, Reverend Yearwood. I guess to follow up with that, I want to pose this to Holly, um, and it relates directly to what Dom was saying, what Reverend Yearwood is saying is, what greenwashing techniques do you come across when you're studying how these companies are marketing and interacting with their customers? And what is greenwashing? I guess is another question I could pose to you. Yeah. Um, so greenwashing is basically using some environmental aspect in your marketing or in the words you're using to try and convince consumers to buy a product because it's environmentally friendly when it might not have a bunch of different environmental um positive environmental effects so um there's four types of greenwashing and we've talked about some of them that i'm gonna quickly go over uh first um, one thing I see is the use of these generic terms such as environmentally friendly or sustainable um, when we don't really have uh, good definitions or some federal legislation that regulates uh, how these terms are used. So when you're talking about sustainable, this could be about sustainable water source, but not sustainable like extraction of fossil fuels, for example. Um so that's a big one because when people see these terms, they think, oh, it's environmentally friendly, but uh, you don't really know the specific environmental benefit um, that a product has when it could be environmentally detrimental um, in some, some other aspect. So that's a big thing. Um, the second is, for me, it's the labeling of recycling. I work on zero waste, um, and I have a big problem with the number system that's used on a lot of bottles. Um, Greenpeace just put out a report um, that the one through seven, only the one, two, and five have rates of recycling that's even 
above like one percent um a lot of the different numbers are not recycled basically at all in the united states and the reason why it's on there is because these companies wanted you to believe these plastics can be recycled when a lot of them can't um this goes into what we were saying earlier these big companies are kind of pushing their responsibility on us to recycle um rather than you know taking the responsibility themselves to reduce the amount of plastics they're producing uh yeah and there is definitely the difference between recyclable and actually being able to recycled be recycled in practice uh this kind of gets to the third which we third reason and type of greenwashing that i've seen uh, which we talk about a lot is these big plastic producers are spending billions of dollars on these ad campaigns to shift the responsibility to us to make sure we don't litter and recycle, um, which we talked about a lot. But one of the things I did want to bring up um, is a type of legislation that we're seeing in um, a lot more states now, which is producer responsibility. Basically, this legislation puts the responsibility back on the producer um, whether it's financially or having them have to recycle amount of content uh, that they produce by a certain year. But we see this in states such as California. Uh, Maryland's actually thinking about EPR in their legislature right now. But that's our first step that we need to take in order to shift the responsibility back to their producer um, for a lot of these plastics that we see. And the thing is, it's better for local governments because right now they're having to foot the bill for a lot of this recycling and um, waste management but they really shouldn't it should be on the producer because you know it things can't be recycled it's well a lot of plastics can't be recycled um and the fourth and one of the biggest problems um i've seen over the past couple months is that Uh, The big uh, plastic producers are talking to companies and telling them that plastic is a more sustainable solution than a lot of different materials. Um, I've talked to my local zero waste store owner about this, and he said um, that they do this under the guise of lower transportation emissions um, and lower resources, but they don't consider, um, like what was in the start of this video, the just the amount of plastic that is produced um <laughs> it's much higher than the amounts of aluminum and glass that are produced and they're not also considering the alternative systems that need to be in place such as refillable and reusable um systems anytime you go to like a convenience store they all have like soda fountains where you can easily bring in your own reusable um cup and just fill it up with whatever, you know, soda, um, stuff you want. Uh, but a lot of these big companies, when they're saying like, oh, plastic is better than some of these other materials, they're not, um, thinking about the reusable systems that we need to get to because, you know, they just want to keep producing the plastic. Um, a good example of this is Snapple. They trans, they went from glass jars to all these plastic bottles and it's, what are you what are you guys doing um yeah so that's um a big problem we're facing because they know like the clock is ticking on our use of fossil fuels and they want to have more ways to use this oil and use this plastic so thank you yeah i fall victim to the greenwashing all the time i actually took i thought composting and compostable items meant I could just dump it in the trash until one of my coworkers, Evan, reminded me that it has to actually be composted. And despite that, we still just consider it biodegradable and easily disappears. Um, before jumping into a Q&A session, we have a pre-recorded interview with Rebecca Brown to discuss the relationship between tobacco and the plastics industry.
Rebecca Brown. I'm the USA Director of Tobacco-Free Portfolios. We're an NGO that advocates uh, for the exclusion of tobacco across all commercial lines of business throughout the financial sector. Have you seen the playbook the tobacco industry has used in the past used by other corporations? Fortunately, yes. And when we're talking about playbook, we're talking about companies that knew the products they produced were harmful to people or planet, yet sort of doubled down on efforts to portray a, a different scenario. So as an example, um, the tobacco companies knew that their products, when used as intended, caused death and disease. Um, and not dissimilarly, the fossil fuel industry has known for decades that the use of their products um, has, is a major contributor to climate change. Um, more clo closer to home when it comes to tobacco, we saw Juul, as an example, follow Big Tobacco's playbook to the T in its efforts. Uh, when it first launched, they marketed heavily to children. Um, there's since been a number of lawsuits that they've settled because of that and made their product as addictive as possible. So this saying you're doing one thing while doing another playbook has been um, replicated by several industries. How does the tobacco industry tie into the plastics industry? It's a great question. And this the tobacco industry fits into the plastics industry uh, in a number of ways. So most importantly to note, and this is often quite a surprise when we talk to people, is that the tobacco filter, the cigarette filter itself is made of plastic. So it's made of cellulose acetate. It's a non-biodegradable plastic. Um, it dissipates into the environment. What's important about this is that the tobacco but itself is the most littered item on the planet by number. So over four and a half trillion tobacco filters, tobacco butts are uh, disposed of each year into the environment, two thirds of which are uh, disposed of irresponsibly. And you might ask, you know, what does that mean? How is there a responsible way of disposing of a tobacco filter? And um, let's call it flicked into the ether, right? So, Tobacco filters get into um, the environment, they get into the food chain. Uh, how do they get into the food chain? They, they get into the waterways and like I said, turn into microplastics and, and, and get into sea life. Um, I, I, there's one um, image that I'd like to share. Uh, so, um, here we go. So cigarette filters are the most littered item on the planet. You'll see this sea creature ingesting a, a tobacco butt. Um, we, the, the cigarette butt is oftentimes the most collected item on ocean, um, on, on beaches. Um, sometimes we see tobacco companies sponsoring beach cleanups sort of to clean up their image. And when you asked before about have we seen other industries use um, Big Tobacco's playbook. Big Tobacco is really great at creating this playbook of um, making it, making the company look sort of like a good neighbor by sponsoring things like beach cleanups. But the product themselves is the inherent problem, right? So um, the production of cigarettes and the marketing of cigarettes um, is the reason why there are cigarettes on the beaches, right? So let me show you another slide now. The, the plastic conversation when it comes to the tobacco industry, you know, we can pinpoint to the, the tobacco filter um, most heavily, but it's also important to note that we have um, plastics in the packaging. We have plastics in um, the the heat not burn and the vaping products. So the vaping uh, cartridges are made of plastics that are very difficult to recycle if, if ever recycled. Um, and also in terms of uh, the, the, these sort of disposable vaping products, um, the, these items typically end up in the landfill 
and the lithium that is in the vaping product could power, you know, upwards of a thousand electric vehicles in the U.S. alone annually. So as we're talking about the impact of um, the, 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 the impact of the industry on the environment, it's really important to note as we're trying to transition to more sustainable um, uh, um, forms of electricity and of transportation, we're literally throwing out uh, lithium that could be used in these vehicles um, into, into the landfill. So another thing that I want to touch on too with regards to plastics in um, cigarette butts is that the, the, the plastics themselves or the cigarette butts themselves are categorized as hazardous waste. And because two thirds of those four and a half trillion filters um, are, that, are, are, that are disposed of annually, um, they, they leach the toxic chem chemicals into the environment. So not only are we dealing with plastic pollution, we're dealing with hazardous waste seeping into the environment. Great. I will thank Rebecca offline for that. Um, next, I wanted to take some time to answer questions from the audience and just pose them to our panelists. Uh, Holly, I think I'm going to pose this first one to you. How can customers demand cost competitive refill schemes from major supermarkets? Yeah, so uh, something my organization has been doing around Whole Foods is that we'll get petitions, signatures, things like that. But um, we've also been doing some press conferences. Aiden was at our uh, first press conference that I had. We have done reports on the amount of plastic they use and how many um, types of their products have plastic-free option. But I think just if we get enough people to go and talk to store managers um, across the U.S., that could also work. But, yeah, just organizing in your community to put pressure on these grocery stores and companies would be good. And another thing is just asking um, consistently if you can bring your own containers for, like, the deli section and the bakery section um, is also a good first step. Thank you, Holly. Let's see, let's take another question. Let's see, Rafit says the GC commits to ending plastic pollution by 2040. Do you think it's feasible and possible? I will first pose this to Dom, um, and then I'd like to hear a follow-up from Reverend Yearwood, if that is okay with you guys. Oh, thanks for the big question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's also something I, I'm glad to hear that you're obviously going to pose it to um to everyone because i think one thing i want to do is make sure that um well, one thing we've committed to at trash free trails is we're a very small organization we kind of see ourselves as like um as plankton in a conservation ecosystem or um and we just we don't really have this aim to become charismatic megafauna we just want to be really good plankton so what we're really good at is light is creating sparks in people and creating sparks in people to um connect with the places they love um, and then off the back of that love to then learn how they can protect and enhance it. So kind of with that said, you know, with that, with the fact that we're not really, we're not, and we don't see ourselves becoming big players in this kind of, in this kind of world. I think it's more about rather than saying feasible, I think it's probably, it's important to have that aim aspirationally because yes, you might get someone maybe saying, Oh, how are you going to do that then? And, and why, you know, surely that's impossible. Whereas I'm thinking, well, if that's not our aim, what are we doing? If that's not our intention, what are we doing? So um, from that perspective, it's important to have these these targets. But again, for us, it's the need the needs to be. And, and one thing we would like to drive as a, you know, punching way above our weight is there needs to be a reset, in my opinion. There needs to be, there needs we need to stop for a second, acknowledge, um, acknowledge, where we've come from and some of the things that we've been doing that maybe haven't quite worked. For example, we know we're 68 years here in the UK into an anti-litter movement. Litter's increased. 
so it's not working you know for example um we also then need to set a, a new way of working together in motion so it's we need to um you know kind of acknowledge that what's gone before our responsibility for that we then need to be transparent about where we're moving forward uh, i've heard a lot of that transparency you know from from both holly and the reverend you know like um they're saying they're doing one thing with one hand you know the kind of misdirection and doing the almost exact opposite with the other uh, yet this one here is far more is, this one's a shiny glove but it's very lovely whereas this one's hidden under, underneath you know um um so we need to, to to have that kind of transparency that builds trust um and then also it needs to be it needs to we need to be accountable um so again examples such as I apologize if I'm bringing them up too much, but well, I won't apologize, but <laughs> you know, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, um, almost like every 10 years, they make the same pledge about reducing the, um, or increasing the content of recycled material in their bottles. They made, they made a, they made a commitment in 1980 to have, um, forgive me, I'm not going to be exactly correct on this. Or if I will, I'm, it's kind of luck a around 20 to 30%, um, recycled material in their bottles by 1990. They made that same pledge in 2010, exactly the same. And that's, that's reference, that's reference material. So you know, again, for me, like I've got an interest, I, I, I'm, I don't deal very well in unspoken things. So for me, that 2040 target, great. But there's so much, there's so much kind of like honesty and resetting that needs to go on before we can do things. Because in other words, you know, the old, um, um, Einstein quote, you know, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. You know, that for me is the anti-litter movement. That for me is the, um, you know, is the, is the climate change conversation. We all know, I mean, um, UNEP have just issued a final call. Like where do we go after the final call to people? If people ignore the final call, where do we go? So that's, something I would like to try to try to see can we do things a bit differently because right now um, I feel like we're sleepwalking into not reaching things like a wonderfully and rightly aspirational 2040 target well before posing this to Reverend Yearwood um, I just have a quick follow-up why do you think it's so easy for these corporations to kind of move the goalpost on their goals like you said they've been making that promise since 1980 what what makes it so easy for them to just change um again you know i hope how obvious it's fairly obvious i'm sure except for the stuff that i have i've got you know referenced and was referenced material a lot of it again is opinion i always want i always think it's important for us in these moments when we're speaking to people just when you are offering your opinion or your organization's opinion you state that as well because you know, there, there may be someone who believes that anti-litter campaigns is working. It's just my opinion that they're not. Um, so um, for for me, that I think the reason, one of the real key reasons, speaking from a grassroots, you know, voluntary um, community organization perspective is fatigue. So, you know, um, if it, it doesn't seem like an, a mistake, uh, uh, an accident for me that it's kind of 10 years that things go in cycles because there's not many people that I started doing this kind of thing with um, in 2010, arguably before that, who are still doing it now. You know, uh, and I've seen many CEOs of organizations, uh, big organizations, have pretty severe burnout, you know, pretty severe mental health and well-being issues. I've seen volunteers, re you know, really suffer because they care so much, but they burn out. Uh, I think they're just waiting us out. They just, they just go, that, you know, someone becomes really effective and powerful and starts to become a thorn in their side, but 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 history shows that those person those persons run out of steam. That these these big machines, these big corporate machines, don't run out of steam. Thank you, Dom. Reverend Yearwood, do you think it's feasible and possible to end plastic pollution by twenty forty? Yes, definitely feasible and possible um, if we have the political will. But that's the, that there is the line, I guess, the rub in the road, right? Uh, the question is, do we have enough political will to get it done? We'll know immediately coming up very shortly. Uh, you no, know, next month will be the plastic treaty uh, in Paris. And, and, and so we'll see right there off the bat how much political will is in regards to making a very strong treaty to ending plastics. We'll see again at the end of this year 
unfortunately at, at not unfortunately but at the cop that unfortunately seems to be being overtaken by a lot of the fossil fuel industries in Dubai but again these are the opportunities so we have the opportunities to create the legislation to create the policies to have to do the thing so that we can have you know we can be ending plastics sooner in many cases if we really wanted to um, I think that the problem though is to what Dom is saying though is that do, can we create the political will? And I think that's really for us as a movement too as well. You know, one of the things Hip Hop Caucus has been doing has been trying to broaden this movement because the way at the size it is now, even globally, it's not big enough to take on the fossil fuel industry. The fossil fuel industry is, is their greed and their survival of trying uh, understanding that they're running out of what they're basing uh, their income on they're, they're at a breakneck pace to create a, a titanic situation. And so do we have enough to herd them off? Science is science, you know, so we can't, it's, we can't stop what's, what's happening. So I think that for us, the key thing here that can we as a movement, and I think it's some things that we can do. I think for us, Hip Hop Caucus, we're, we're using culture. I would in, invite anybody to go to our we shall breathe.com website in which we actually did a docu series on called big oils last lifeline i'd invite people to go there and watch that docu series and it's a it's very informative of the grassroots movement fighting against uh oil and petrochemicals and trying to stop plastics second i would think that we need to have members in congress here in, in america or across the globe who are serious. We, we are honoring our uh, one of our fallen champions, uh, Congressman Donald McKeachin, who was a congressperson out of Virginia who was literally fighting for environmental justice for all. And so we are honoring some of his some of his members who are picking up the mantle. So it's important. I think thirdly, I think that we have to figure out a way to, again, to figure out the resources conversation. You know, it's very serious. I think that we've seen, particularly, um, that we've been calling for a Justice 40. So we're excited about that, what's happening with the Inflation Reduction Act and CHIPS and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Those are that's exciting. But in, on, on the other side, we have a movement. To keep it keep it real, we say in, in hip hop, is that you know most of the resources are going to predominantly white, white-led organizations. And when you have that, then you have a pretty much predominantly white, white-led movement that isn't big enough and strong enough to do what it needs to do so we got to change some things we got to have some real we, we can't ask the world to transition if we're not ready to transition so i think that this moment can we get there of course we definitely can but it will require political will it require us as a movement being able to to really transition ourselves and also having policy and other means to create the political will need to make the change happen. Thank you, Rev. Um, I just want to ask the same question to Holly. Do you think it's possible and feasible to end plastic pollution by 2040? I know most of your research is concentrated in the U.S., but I'd like to hear your thoughts on the international ending of plastic pollution. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard, right, because convenience has this such firm grip on us that we – need to like have the single use and all these things um from the grocery store really fast and really quick um so it's going to have to take like a slow down of our rapid lifestyles in order to do it but i think if we focus on supply chains and doing more research for them for these refillable systems that i've been talking about and these reusable systems and how all communities can um, benefit from them. I think that's the way to do it. And I think one of the first steps is to recognize that this single use plastic is another lifeline for the fossil fuel industry, right? Like we see with Exxon, how they're building these advanced recycling facilities that um, for anyone who doesn't know, like advanced recycling is, a negative solution or a false solution as we like to call it because it's basically just burning plastic but um companies like exxon are using plastic as a lifeline so they're trying to come up with these solutions to um 
recycle and get rid of this plastic when it doesn't it doesn't work um so yeah we just need to first acknowledge that it's a lifeline for fossil fuels and then think about this fast-paced uh convenience culture that we're in and kind of the steps we need to um take to reduce our single-use plastic thank you holly um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, shared responsibility, but not equal accountability. Dom, I think you were the first to speak on this a little bit. I'll let you pose this question first to you. Uh, we got a couple minutes left. I think you're on mute still. I think I'm just trying to pick that apart. I'd love to be able to speak to the person who, to, to Mark and just to um, ask just a little bit of clarification. So as in, I'm, I'm hoping Mark's saying that he agrees with shared responsibility, but he disagrees with equal accountability. Is that is that how you would read it? Let's see. I think he does agree with shared responsibility, but he I, I think he doesn't believe there is equal accountability. Yeah. Oh, That's well, where he's going with that question. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's deliberate, isn't it? <laughs> so so yeah. the, the, I think, I don't, th I don't think there is any don't think there is any doubt that it's a deliberate um, tactic, you know, um, across those industries that both Rebecca and well, everyone's spoken about. Um, so that's the first thing is that, yeah, of course, it's not equal accountability, um, especially when you think about it on that individual level, you know, the, the volume of guilt that, that each individual person is expected to, to, to burden, um, you know, if you compare that proportionally to coca-cola or exxon it's, it's so disproportionate isn't it um uh, so i think that's the first one also again the communities um who have to you know again shoulder the burden of the pollution you know the outcomes of this pollution again that's disproportionate um so so yeah i, I don't want to go broken record and i and i i'm always in these in these meetings i like uh, you know these panels i'm always thinking oh wow what a great follow-up there that reverend yearwood said about plastics treaty and things and you know i wish i'd said that so it's the thing is is i just it's the broken record for me though is is how do we how do we figure out that it uh, can we get big business can we get them to be more honest do you know like can we get the can, can we get uh, the public at large to be more critical in their thinking about what they're being told by um, by big business, you know, um, and can like I said, then if we can get if we can figure out a way of doing that, then perhaps then there is, you know, for people who need that transparency, perhaps then we can start to move forward from that. Um, I, I don't know because obviously, as soon as you, I know full, you know, I know full well that if you know, big business very rarely admits any kind of fault because obviously especially in america litigation tends to follow um admission of fault which is again a massive problem i think um so um yeah and then you know another another angle for me would, would be um um well i forgot my point there sorry it was, it was following on from from holly's uh i'm thinking so much on my feet with this one that i'm uh, that i'm pulling out i think um, yeah, I think I'll pause there and hopefully someone else might have a, have a bit of a follow on like they have been so far. <laughs> uh, yes. But thanks for the question. I would, I would like to jump in there, Aiden, if possible. Yeah, of course. I think, I mean, I'm following, following what Dom is saying. And I think what's very important here is that we're at this moment where corporations, we want them to be friends. And there are some who mm -hmm. are, who are definitely doing good and we want them to do well. Nothing wrong with that. And that's, I think, you know, I think Holly mentioned one company, and I think there's many, many others we can talk about. What we're, what we're talking about here, though, is that we're talking about companies who's, who, as we look for a, a, an intersectional environmental movement, they are being, their intersectional is evil. And let me give you an example. Norfolk Southern, I mentioned earlier, is the train company that was carrying the vinyl chloride, which is the plastic that creates the the plastics that are deadly to our community that derailed in East Palestine, Ohio. And with that, um, what we know is that they are hurting that community in East Palestine, Ohio, but they're also funding things like Cop City in Atlanta, which is the same place where the climate activists tort an, an amazing non-binary activist 
who was a, a force defender, was killed they're defending the Willany Forest in Atlanta, but they're funding that, right? So they're funding the, the, the cop facility and they're funding the petrochemicals. So they understand that climate justice is racial justice, but we sometimes don't understand that, right? And so we, I, I'm always curious to how come their intersectional is evil, but why our intersectional can't be good? And so I think in this process, we're talking about these companies, they understand that they're trying to break the, it's an overall mentality of just doing bad stuff and, and at the cost of greed and bottom lines. They're literally putting profits before people. And what we're saying here is that they understand quite clearly, Exxon understood their harms on the, I mean, they knew what they knew better than anybody, their harms on, on, on the atmosphere, on, on the environment, on the climate. So, uh, uh, um, you know, Chevron or people in, the, in California say Chevron, but Chevron and others and, and, and BP and many others, they, they're very clear and what they're doing. And this continues over with plastics. And so you add that now with the greenwashing, um, you add that now with the climate delay, you add that now with all these things so they can just keep making money. And they're hoping that they're, what they're doing to us will somehow do climate technology that they'll just be saved at the last minute. But that isn't how this works. And so for many young people, for many at-risk communities, they understand that, yes, we're still fighting for equality, but we're also fighting for existence. Like literally these companies are putting our lives at, at risk and our children's lives and our, our neighbors' lives and our mothers and fathers. They're literally more interested in their bottom line than our climate and our planet. And that just can't be the case. And so as the humans on this planet, Humans from all ilk, black, white, brown, red, male, female, straight, gay, theist, atheist, humans. We got to stand up no matter where we are on the continent, in the UK, in South America, here in America, wherever we are, humans got to be like enough is enough. We got to stop with this plastics. We can transition and we got to make it happen right now. And I think that's what this Earth Week is. That's what we got to do. And we got to be serious at this moment, at this time. Thank you, Ro, for that. Uh, we have one more question that we can pose. Can you explain why compostable and biodegradable plastics are a bad choice? I'll leave that open to whoever wants to discuss it, Holly or Dom. I got some thoughts, but Holly, go first. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it goes into what I said earlier with the very generic terms. When you say something is biodegradable, this could mean a, a range of different things and the same with compostable. And then the other half of that is the access, right? A lot of people don't have access to those um, composting facilities that you need to break down some of these materials. When it says it compostable, that doesn't necessarily mean it will be compostable in your backyard. Something that um, my organization is working on right now is the Federal Trade Commission. They have these green guides that kind of suggest to companies how they um, can market without greenwashing, but none of that information is um actual statutes or legislation none of it uh, none of these companies are actually accountable um to these suggestions and these green guides so yeah thank you dom i'll let you finish oh, it yeah. out I, I might be looking frustrated here because uh, part of my research project uh i've actually got um um in um three forest locations in north wales i've got um, um 30 items of litter out in 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 five meter plots and I'm looking at how that, how, looking at what happens to that litter in that environment uh, over a year. And I've just done my final monitoring, or actually over nine months. And uh, it links straight to this. Really, is I, I I'm really frustrated because I've got, I've, I've been, I've taken clippings of some of the items when I placed them, and now when I've, when, at the end of the study, um, and one thing I clipped uh, and I've clipped again is a compostable carrier bag, plastic bag from a supermarket. Um, and also a biodegradable dog poo bag. Um, both of them are in perfect working order now after nine months. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, you know, I think I think if you asked people what they would envisage when they heard compostable or biodegradable, I, I suspect, you know, for me personally, it would be something along the lines of an apple or, a, you know, an apple core or a leaf. 
Um, and there are some biodegradable plastics and bioplastics that degrade um, at a similar rate to a leaf. Um, but there are some because, like Holly said, there's no legislation in place to do, define uh, the parameters of whether you can call something biodegradable. Some of them uh, behave, you know, take almost as much time as normal plastics to biodegrade. And some don't even biodegrade. Some photodegrade and they're so brazen in their in their lies essentially they they're calling the the sun's rays on a, on the on the plastic biodegradation when really i i classify it as you being used by life for life um so I mean, that's such a wild west thing and again what it what it is you know and again this is reference studied you know peer reviewed it is another tactic to to essentially medicate us to what's the word um uh, sedate us or just keep us consuming at the same rate doesn't matter doesn't matter you know like oh i, I still i see that you're getting worried about plastics it's okay we've created bioplastics now we, we've created compostable keep consuming at the same rate don't think just keep consuming um and that's that's what's what's going on here really with with these bioplastics they're a diversion um a deliberate diversion i just want to add that at hip hop caucus we've actually doing a, on this topic and other topics like it we're doing animation series to to really explain this kind of like in a schoolhouse rock style. So I would encourage folk to 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 on this issue and others go to hiphopcaucus.org and check out the animation. If you, and if you have an idea for animation you want us to cover, let us know at Hip Hop Caucus, and we'll definitely try to turn that hard climate conversation into an animation that's easy for everyone to understand. Well, thank you. Well, that concludes our panel discussion on the role of petrochemical and tobacco industries play in plastic pollution. Uh, thank you all so much for attending and a special thank you to our awesome panelists and the Earth Day team for all of the help, their help and the work that they do. Happy Earth Day and enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>